From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 49, recorded on January 13th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on important health topics. Let me just say at the outset, Dr. Paul Offit is a pediatrician. He takes care of patients, works out of the University of Pennsylvania. He has developed at least one vaccine, right, Paul? Right, rotavirus vaccine, just one. These are his qualifications for the statements uh, that he is going to make on this video, which are all in support of vaccines and vaccination. <clears throat> If you enjoy this program, we'd love to have your support, microbe.tv slash contribute. Today, we're going to look at Paul's latest column called A Dangerous Time for America's Children, Part 1. So, Paul, the informed, you, you say in this column, the Informed Consent Action Network, I can, hired a lawyer to try and suspend the distribution of 14 vaccines. So, first of all, what is I can? So ICANN Informed Consent Action Network is a anti-vaccine group that has for years put out misinformation and disinformation about vaccines, largely to scare parents away from using them. So you're right, they hired this lawyer, uh, whose name was Aaron Siri, to basically um, work on their behalf and to, uh, to fulfill what is their mission, which is, again, to provide largely or to, to, to scare people about vaccines. So this idea that you could suspend distribution of 14 vaccines, is that even possible for vaccines that are FDA approved? Well, I would have said um, uh, in previous years, no. I think the FDA largely just sees these kind of petitions as nuisance petitions. They mm. respond to them. But now, you know, the way things are now, where you have Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who may be the head of Health and Human Services, or Marty McCarry, who may be the head of FDA, um, you think the rules may change. I guess we'll see what will happen over the next few years. So, for example, if Marty McCary were confirmed as the head of the FDA, he may say to this lawyer, yeah, OK, we're going to suspend all 14 for you. That, that's how it would work. Well, it, it's it's so the, the thinking is behind these petitions is that either vaccines haven't been adequately studied, meaning subjected to placebo controlled trials, or that there's been a misrepresentation of the amount of aluminum adjuvants that is uh, on mm -hmm. the label as compared to what was tested in the laboratory. Um, that, that sort of thing is, is largely a nuisance suit. But I, I think um, anything goes these days in the world of uh, misinformation. It's like there's an old W.H. Auden quote, which was, uh, when all the mass and majesty of this world, when all that carried weight and always weighed the same, lay in the hands of others. And that's what I fear is going mm. on now. Everything that we counted on, like good scientific studies or good information, just seems to be just another voice in the room, a distant voice in the room. So could the head of the FDA do this? Could he say, we can't, we're not, we're disapproving these vaccines, we're suspending them? They, that's within their power? Sure. Yes. Well, Paul, if uh, Marty McCary uh, is confirmed as head, it will be interesting to see if you remain on the advisory board, right? Oh, I was just asked to re-up. I mean, I, I was I was brought on in 2017 for a four-year term. And then after that, in 2021, we were in the midst of the COVID pandemic. They asked me to sign up for another tour of duty, which then ended this in January of 2025 now. Mm. And so I was just called and asked to re-up for another four years. I've agreed to re-up for another couple of years, but um, we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, who knows? I mean, that could be revoked too, just like vaccines could be revoked, right? All right, let's get down to the nitty gritty here. The, the petition, petition number one, uh, this one gets me as much as it gets you, is to suspend approval for inactivated polio vaccine until it can be properly tested. I don't know, Paul, in my studies of polio, which go back 40 years, I learned that the 1955 clinical trial that Jonas Salk did of IPV was the biggest ever. Right. And, and the, the inactivated vaccine, inactivated polio vaccine that's made today is made in the exact same way as that vaccine, which is to say, take polio virus, grow it up in laboratory cells, purify it and activate it with formaldehyde. No difference. The, the only 
difference is that um, Jonas Salk used primary kidney cells. They were obtained from animals that mm-hmm. had been transported over here from usually places like the Philippines or Sri Lanka. They were held in a, um, in a or I'm sorry, the Philippines and Singapore. And then they were held in a, in a holding facility in South Carolina. And then primary cells were used. The animals were sacrificed. And those were the kidney cells that were used. Now we use sort of this more continuous cell line so-called Vero cells, African green monkey kidney cells, which have been around really since the night, early 1960s. And that's the thinking. Well, we didn't test that vaccine made in, in Vero cells, um, which are perfectly safe and have a long record of safety. And so it's, it's, a, it's a nuisance suit and you're, you're not going to do it. You're, you're not going to do a prospective placebo controlled trial with this inactivated polio vaccine because polio still exists, not only in this world, but in this country, if you look at that 2022 case in Rockland County. And, and so so what happened was, interestingly, is the lawyer, when he filed this, I think didn't realize that he had stepped on a landmine. And Mitch McConnell very quickly stepped up and said, wait a second, because McConnell was a polio survivor. You know, mm-hmm. this is dangerous stuff to do. And so did Donald Trump. I mean, Trump was born in 1946. He was born roughly 10 years before there was this vaccine. So he remembers how feared this virus was. And so the lawyer quickly backed away and said, wait a second. I'm not saying we, you can't have a polio vaccine because there's the inactivated polio vaccine in several combination vaccines, which makes even less sense. Because if you're saying it's not safe and effective because it hasn't adequately been tested, why is it safe and effective if it's in these combination vaccines? It's the same vaccine. Mm, yes, that doesn't make sense at all. But in fact, you can't do a placebo controlled trial today. It would be un- unethical, right? Right. You can't do a placebo control trial when there is an existing vaccine that you know works. You, you can't do that. That's unethical. It just puts children uh, at unnecessary risk. You know, polio virus is circulating in many places, including the U.S. We use an activated polio vaccine. It does not stop circulation. So if you suspended its use, uh, you would very quickly have a lot of cases of poliomyelitis in this country. That's right. This is the same strain that's causing an outbreak in Gaza. And and you and I have both talked about this. I would yeah. love the CDC not only to look at these wastewater samples in Rockland County or surrounding counties, but Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, because I think then people can understand what the risks are better than they understand them now. Yeah. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but more and more countries are testing positive for this oral polio virus. It's all throughout Europe now. I think Germany was the last European country to report it. This is all wastewater testing. Australia has reported it. They don't even use it. So obviously someone came in and delivered it. So yeah, I, I, I think we mentioned this recently. It's really unfortunate that the U.S. is not testing wastewater for polio virus. And I think people have a misunderstanding. They think, well, it's, it's a vaccine-derived strain. Therefore, in some ways, it must be uh, less dangerous. But the clinical signs and symptoms of polio caused by this strain are indistinguishable from wild-type virus. Yeah, and also don't think that we, we may not have poliomyelitis here in the U.S., but that's because we have very high vaccination rates. That's right. Um, and in, in, nine, in 2022 in Rockland County, there was a case of poliomyelitis because the vaccination rates dropped, I think, to 50%. Well, I think in his, his, zip, his particular zip code, I think it was 30%. 30%, right, yeah. yeah. Do you know offhand what percent coverage you need to maintain protection, over 90%? Probably not that high, but but certainly much yeah. higher than 30 percent, as we just proved. Jonas Salk would be rolling in his grave. <laughs> OK, yep. the, the next one, um, the lawyer wants the hepatitis. There are two hepatitis B virus vaccines. He wants those also properly tested. What's going on there? Well, it's the same problem. I mean, you can't. Um, he, he's arguing that these two. Uh, hepatitis B vaccines are recombinant DNA vaccines that consist of essentially one protein, hepatitis B surface antigen, that they were never tested in placebo controlled trials. There was a reason for that. There was an existing vaccine. So in 1981, we had the so-called plasma derived hepatitis B vaccine, which worked and was safe. Then we sort of moved to the recombinant vaccine in the early 1990s. And so you can't do placebo controlled trials with that vaccine when you had an existing vaccine. Uh, the reason that we moved from it, interestingly, was that the, the plasma-derived vaccine, which was uh, the product of Maurice Hilleman at Merck, I think was probably this, the safest, be- safest vaccine ever made for the most dangerous starting material. Because the, the mm-hmm. starting material <laughs> was 
hepatitis B surface antigen uh, found in the bloodstream of generally men who had sex with men uh, in New York City in the in the sort of late 70s, early 1980s, because they also were infected with hepatitis B. And so, so were those early lots, could they have contained human immunodeficiency virus? Yes. But that 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 uh, those those uh, products were treated. Plasma derived vaccine was treated with a combination of formaldehyde, urea, pepsin, with three inactivating agents that Marie Silliman had showed in a series of publications in proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences could kill any known human virus. So I think honestly, it was the safest vaccine ever made in terms mm-hmm. of that. It was also very pure. It was like ninety nine percent hepatitis B surface antigen. So it was a pure, safe vaccine, but because of the starting material being human blood, people just feared it. And so we moved to the recombinant DNA vaccine. But the data show that these two vaccines that we use today, the recombinant vaccines, they're very safe and effective, no no doubt. Yes. When we, we had a newborn vaccine recommendation in 1991, at the time, there were 18,000 children every year, less than 10 years of age, who would get hepatitis B. Half of it got it from their mothers when they passed through a birth canal that was contaminated with a virus. The other half got it from relatively casual contact. These are children less than 10 with people who didn't know they were infected with hepatitis B virus, which Mm -hmm. is why that infection was often called a silent epidemic. And so um, we've basically eliminated hepatitis B in children less than 18. It's an amazing accomplishment. Yet here you have this this, uh, petition saying, no, this wasn't well tested. It's really hard to watch. What is the current CDC recommendation for HPV vaccination? Well, well, that all newborns get a series of vaccines in the first few months of life to protect them against this virus. And the reason being that if you acquire this virus in the first few months of life, you're at much, much greater risk of developing chronic liver disease, meaning cirrhosis and liver cancer. So it's a critical time. That's why you have it as a newborn recommendation. recommendation. Okay. And finally, the, there's another petition to remove 13 other vaccines they contain aluminum. What What's that about? Right. So this is based on um, this particular uh, lawyer's sense that there was a paper that was published uh, out of the U- UK that, that sort of independently looked at the quantity of aluminum salts that were contained as an adjuvant in a series of vaccines and found that there were some differences. Some case there was a little more, some case there was a little less, some case there was exactly the same amount. But again, you were talking about sort of fractions of a milligram. I mean, a milligram is a thousandth of a gram. So it's again, let's assume that's true. Even if it is true, it's sort of a distinction without a difference. I mean, aluminum is the most abundant light metal on the surface of this planet. We're all exposed to aluminum. And if you look at at children, for example, who receive aluminum-containing vaccines and compare them to children who receive uh, aluminum, who either don't receive vaccines or receive aluminum-free vaccines, what you find is that there's no difference in biological specimens in the amount of aluminum because we're always exposed to aluminum. So again, it's uh, much ado about nothing. And I think the goal is to just sort of tie up the FDA and scare people and and that, that things aren't being adequately tested or supervised. And I think the general population, when they hear that these vaccines that have been around for many years are being challenged, they probably get scared, right? Right. And that's what you're seeing. I mean, you're seeing an erosion in vaccine rights. I'm not just talking about COVID vaccines. I'm talking about uh, kindergartners vaccine rates, which the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, a publication of the CDC recently showed that, that, that the more parents are choosing non-medical exemptions, meaning philosophical exemption or religious exemption to vaccines than ever before. It succeeded like 3.3%. There are some jurisdictions where it succeeded 5%. And so mm-hmm. the, the, the thinking is this is now starting to challenge herd immunity. And that's what you're seeing. We went from 5,000 cases of whooping cough last year to 32,000 this year. We went from like four outbreaks of measles last year involving about 50 uh, uh, children to more than 16 outbreaks this year involving 280 children. We're going in the wrong direction. And I think um, it's, it's, these are just risks that are not worth taking. So on the off chance that these petitions were successful and, four, and these 14 vaccines were suspended, what would happen? We'll go back to where we were back at a time before we had them. And you'll see you, what will have to happen initially is you'll have to increase the number of susceptibles before you'll have a critical increase so that you, you then start to see outbreaks. Mm-hmm. Um, it may take a few years for that to happen, but it will happen. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just interesting to me that, I mean, my parents were children of the, of the 20s. My father was born in, in 24, my mother in 28. And what they were scared of, what their parents were scared of was diphtheria 
which was mm -hmm. one of the most common killers of, of teenagers, they were scared of pertussis because there wasn't a pertussis vaccine until 47, which was causing 8,000 deaths a year. I mean, I'm a child of the, the 1950s. I had measles, I had mumps, I had German measles, I had chicken pox. But measles at the time caused 500,000, sorry, 500 deaths and 48,000 hospitalizations and a thousand children every year would get measles and cephalitis, a quarter of whom would result, would result in permanent brain damage and cephalitis is, is inflammation of the brain. Mumps was the most common cause of acquired deafness. Rubella or German measles would cause 20 to 25,000 cases of birth defects every year when women who were pregnant were infected in the first trimester. Blindness, deafness, heart defects, permanent heart defects. And I just think that it's like not only that we've largely eliminated these diseases and we eliminated rubella by the year 2005, we've eliminated the memory of these diseases. And that's the, the, what we're suffering right now is that loss of memory. I think people should also understand that the viruses and bacteria uh, that are the subject of these vaccines are still around. People may think that they're gone, but they're not. And that's why they would come back, right? Absolutely. Rubella is still fairly common in the world. International travel is common. Let rubella vaccine rates drop far enough and this feared infection will be back. And women feared this infection when they got pregnant because they knew that it could cause permanent harm in their, in their child. Could, mm -hmm. or likely could. And then they had to make a decision. Let's hope we don't get to that point where we have recurring outbreaks of polio and measles and rubella and whooping cough and et cetera, et cetera. Let's hope we don't have to get to that point to reinstate these vaccines should they be suspended. No, it's always the most vulnerable among us who suffer our ignorance. And in this case, it's our children. We'll put a link to the column in the show notes so you can go and read it. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.